committee to consider a list of 3,196 pending military nominations. All of these nominations have been before the committee. The required length of time is a motion to favorably report these 3,196 military nominations. To so the moved. Senate. Is there a second? second? All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion carries. <coughs> the committee meets this morning to consider the nomination of General Joseph Dunford for reappointment as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Dunford, this committee thanks you for your decades of distinguished service to our nation. We are grateful to your wife, Ellen, for the support that she has always provided to you and to all who serve our nation in uniform. I'd also like to welcome your son, Patrick. Patrick? <laughs> Fortunately, you look like your mother, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> who is joining us this morning. I know that your other children, Joe and Kathleen, send their support from afar, even as I bet they are a little relieved that they do not have to sit through your interrogation. In order to exercise its legislative and oversight responsibilities, it's important that this committee and other appropriate committees of the Congress are able to receive testimony, briefings, and other communications of information. Have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? I have, Chairman. Do you agree when asked to give your personal views, even if those views differ from the administration in power? I, I do, Chairman. Have you assumed any duties or undertaken any actions which would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? I, I have not, Chairman. Will you ensure your staff complies with deadlines established for requested communications, including questions for the record in hearings? I will, Chairman. Will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to congressional requests? Yes, Chairman. Will those witnesses be protected from reprisal for their testimony or briefings? They will be, Chairman. Do you agree if confirmed to appear and testify upon request before this committee? I, I do, Chairman. Do you agree to provide documents, including the copies of electronic forms of communication in a timely manner when requested by a duly constituted committee or to consult with the committee regarding the basis for any good faith delay or denial in providing such documents? I do, Chairman. And I, I, my colleagues and I are aware that that is a routine, but given the, the political environment today especially, and certainly not any reflection on you, General Dunford, but those questions need to be asked. And I thank you for your responses. General Dunford, my colleagues and I will have a lot of questions for you about the many pressing national security challenges we face, but this hearing also offers an opportunity to reflect on some broader topics that have historically and more recently been a major focus of this committee's efforts. The unique role of the chairman in our national security structure and the state of civil military relations. As, quote, principal military advisor to the president, the National Security Council, the Secretary of Defense, and the Congress, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is the most important military duty in our nation. The Chairman is the one military officer with the authority to present comprehensive analysis and advice to civilian policy makers informed by all the military services and combatant commands and spanning every global and functional issue of national security. This responsibility is now more important than ever. Our country faces a multitude of national security challenges, all of which cut across the regional and functional organizations that divide up the Department of Defense. The chairman is the only military officer with a truly comprehensive perspective on the joint force, on of all the threats we face worldwide, and the interplay between them. That is why this committee acted last year to clarify the chairman's statutory responsibility to advise civilian leaders on the global strategic integration of our <laughs> military efforts. The chairman's unique role lends extra gravity to the responsibility that you and every military officer possesses, the responsibility to provide best military advice to civilian leaders. This is not a luxury, it is a duty. It is a duty that military officers owe to the American people and to the men and women under their command. Civilian policymakers in both the executive and legislative branches rely on our military professionals to better understand the military dimensions of the national security challenges we face and the options at our disposal for wielding military power effectively. But best military advice does not stop there. 
military officers, and especially the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, must tell their civilian superiors what action they believe are best and right to take, and they must do so honestly, candidly, respectfully, but forcefully, whether civilians want to hear it or not. Best military advice may be disregarded, but it must always be given. What's more, in my opinion, best military advice should not be narrowly limited to technical military matters. When the chairman offers his best military advice, he's not simply offering the best advice about the military, but rather the best advice from the military. And that extends to issues of national security policy, strategy, and operations. For example, the decision to take our nation to war properly rests with civilians. It's a policy question, but military officers should not be prohibited from voicing their advice on such a matter. Indeed, it is their to duty to do so. If you haven't uh, seen uh, uh, Mr. Burns' um, series on Vietnam, I suggest that you pay attention to it, and I suggest that you examine the tensions that existed between the civilian superiors and the military. And I believe that you will come to the conclusion that the military advice was not given <coughs> the weight and effect that it, uh, that it should have, which was one of the factors in leading to 58,000 names on the wall in Granite, not too far from here. <coughs> Just as we are clear about what constitutions best military, Con constitutes, excuse me, best military advice, we must be equally clear about its limitation. Ad advice is just that, advice. The chairman is principal military advisor is not in the chain of command. Ours is not a general staff system. In our system, operational command rests with combatant commanders who report by law to the Secretary of Defense. The chairman must also, also advise civilian leaders on the military dimensions of strategy operations and plans both within and among our combatant commander's area of responsibility, and it is his right, indeed his responsibility, to provide competing advice to policymakers when he disagrees with combatant commanders. But the chairman is not an operational commander. Similarly, best military advice does not mean independent advice. It occurs in the context of civil-military relations, and I want to say a few words on this in closing. Professor Elliot Cohen has described civil-military relations as an unequal dialogue. Civilian and military rules are not to be dichotomized and held apart. Rather, they must be brought together through an iterative process of discussing, scrutinizing, and refining military strategy, operations, and plans, a process in which civilian leaders must play an active role and make the major decisions. Best military advice is central to this dialogue, but it can never replace it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I sense that this civil-military dialogue has become strained. At times, civilian officials have disrespected military leaders, disregarded their advice on critical military matters, and shirked accountability for their decisions. More recently, civilian oversight and control of the military has morphed into meddling and micromanagement of tactical details for political purposes, which has, armed, which has harmed military effectiveness. The last administration distinguished itself in this regard. What we must guard against, General Dunford, especially now, when so many civilian leaders at the Department of Defense are either missing or are themselves recently retired military officers, is an overcorrection. We cannot afford to swing from civilian micromanagement to civilian marginalization. We need to restore balance in civil-military relations where best military advice is always rendered and received, but has done so as part of a dialogue with civilians who participate actively and have the last word on policy, strategy, operations, and plans. This committee takes its obligations seriously in this regard. The civil-military dialogue does not only occur within the Department of Defense. It occurs between the branches of government as well. That's why the chairman also serves as a principal military advisor to the Congress. And that's why, as part of the confirmation process, we ask 
current and future chairmen, like all military officers, to provide their best personal advice to this committee if asked. It is to ensure that the members of this committee and the full Congress are able to meet our independent constitutional responsibilities to the Americans we serve. At present, this committee and the Congress more broadly is not receiving the information and respect it deserves as a co-equal branch of government. We do not work for the president or the executive branch. We have distinct and equal responsibilities under the Constitution, and the administration needs to understand its obligation to the Congress in this regard. Too often, members of this committee are learning in the media for the first time about major national security and military activities that we, as the Committee of Oversight, should be told about and consulted on in advance. Even now, Nearly 10 months into this year, we are told we have a new strategy for Afghanistan, but members of this committee have far more questions than answers. The administration must do better, and until it does, the Congress and this committee will be forced to use what levers we have to show the administration that we are not and will not be a rubber stamp. We will have many questions for you, General. We look forward to your candid, forthright, and best military advice, Senator Reid. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I also want to welcome General Dunford uh, this morning and thank you for his outstanding service to this nation over many years. General Dunford is joined by his wife, Ellen, and son, Patrick. Thank you. And i also like to acknowledge uh, the General's other children, Joe and Kathleen, who are not able to join us today. And on behalf of our committee, we thank the entire Dunford family for their continued sacrifice and support. It means a great deal to to us, but more particularly to the men and women of the armed forces. Thank you. Thank you. Under the leadership of Chairman McCain, this committee has maintained a robust hearing schedule focused on the most pressing threats and challenges facing our armed forces. Our committee has heard from the most senior political leaders in the department, the highest echelons of the military, and distinguished outside experts. Time and again, these hearings have underscored that the United States is faced with a myriad of challenges that offer no quick or easy solutions and require adroit military leadership. During General Dunford's tenure as chairman, he has provided sound military counsel and demonstrated a deep understanding of the national security threats our nation must address. As chairman, General Dunford has made it a priority to keep this committee well informed on the department's policy decisions impacting our armed forces and changes to our military strategy to counter the risks posed by our adversaries. While this committee may not always agree with General Dunford's views, he has been honest and conducted himself with integrity. Therefore, I believe he should be reappointed to serve as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. As we pause to consider the state of the world today, General Dunford's professionalism and commitment to duty have served him well. This is not the first time in our nation's history that we have had to confront multiple threats from abroad, but it is an incredibly dangerous and uncertain time. North Korea's nuclear missile program poses an immediate and grave national security threat, and heightened tensions on the peninsula are a deep cause for concern. The global order established by the United States following World War II is under siege by a revanchist Russia determined to reassert its influence around the world. China continues its saber-rattling the Asia-Pacific region by undermining the freedom of navigation and using economic coercion of its smaller, more vulnerable neighbors. Iran continues their aggressive weapons development activities, including ballistic missile development efforts, as well as other destabilizing activities in the region. Finally, our military has been consumed by two prolonged wars against violent extremist groups like ISIS that has sapped readiness and precluded our military personnel from training for full spectrum operations. As we grapple with these threats, we must also be mindful that our president continues to show a lack of in-depth knowledge or nuance in foreign policy and defense matters. It had been my sincere hope that the magnitude of the office, coupled with the enormous challenges we face, would have encouraged the president to be more judicious with his comments and thoughtful with his actions. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. To date, our foreign policy has been predicated on alienating longtime allies, discounting the value of international organizations and our global commitments, and retreating from our leadership role in the world. While at the same time, decisions on our defense posture and complicated military personnel issues are promulgated by presidential tweet. Such trends lend more uncertainty to already dangerous times, and I believe the risk of miscalculation and unintended consequences have never been higher. Resolute leadership at the highest echelons of our military is a necessity, now more than ever. I commend General Dunford for the steady hand he has demonstrated in guiding the Joint Chiefs during his tenure as chairman, 
And for the Sterling example, he has set for all those that wear the uniform. Thank you again, General Dunford, for your willingness to serve our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Dunford, welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman McCain, Ranking Member Reed, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm honored to be renominated as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'd like to begin by thanking the committee for your support of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. This year's National Defense Authorization Act is a reflection of your commitment to ensure that they remain the most well-trained, well-equipped, and capable military force in the world. Today, we have a competitive advantage over any adversary, and I can say with confidence that our armed forces are ready to protect the homeland and meet our alliance commitments. However, that, that advantage has eroded in recent years. If reconfirmed, I look forward to working together with the committee to ensure that the chairman testifying in 2025 has the same degree of confidence in our ability to provide for the common defense. This committee is keenly aware of today's complex and volatile security environment. Uh, both the chairman and the ranking member have mentioned it and I don't expect the strategic landscape to improve in the near future. Russia continues to invest in a full range of capabilities designed to limit our power projection, <coughs> erode U.S. influence, and undermine the credibility of the NATO alliance. Similarly, China is focused on limiting our ability to project power and weakening our alliances in the Pacific. Iran is projecting malign influence across the Middle East, threatening freedom of navigation, while supporting terrorist organizations in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. And while we're all focused on the destabilizing threat posed by North Korea and Kim Jong-un's relentless pursuit of a nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile that can threaten the United States, we are also confronted by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other trans-regional terrorist organizations. And while we've made significant progress against core ISIS in Iraq and Syria, we are not complacent and much work remains to be done. In Afghanistan, we are beginning to deploy additional U.S. and coalition forces in support of the President's broader South Asia strategy. In the context of these and other challenges, we need a renewed focus to restore joint readiness and develop the warfighting capabilities we'll need to defend the nation in the future. As this committee has highlighted in hearings, we face very real and significant readiness challenges today, and we have failed to adequately invest in the future. I can't state it any clearer. If we don't address this dynamic with sustained, sufficient, and predictable funding over the course of several years, we will lose our qualitative and quantitative competitive advantage. In the end, this will have a profound effect on our ability to deter conflict and to respond effectively if deterrence fails. <coughs> if reconfirmed, I'll commit to working with the administration and the Congress in addressing these challenges to ensure our men and women in uniform never find themselves in a fair fight. The chairman, I listened very carefully to your opening statement. I fully understand my responsibilities to provide candid best military advice to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Council, and I'll be forthright when I'm asked to appear before this committee and other congressional venues. And with that, I'm prepared to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, General. In June, you testified without sustained, sufficient, and predictable funding. I assess that within five years, we will lose our ability to project power we still don't have sustained, sufficient, and predictable funding. And, I, and as you mentioned, I'm not sure we will for the foreseeable future unless Congress finally steps up to do its job. As you know, we'll start fiscal year 2018 on a continuing resolution with no insight into what the final funding levels will be for the year. Um, what, what, what's the effect of the average first lieutenant uh, who's uh, out there, captain, uh, has a company command, and, uh, and, they, and they don't have sufficient funds to carry out their training regimen, and uh, their pilots are flying less hours per month than their Chinese and Russian counterparts. What, what, first of all, what effect does that have on our ability to defend the nation? And second of all, what does it do to the men and women of the all-volunteer force? Chairman, I'll, I'll answer the first part. Uh, when you say, "What does it do to our ability to defend the our ability to defend the nation?" and uh, when I when I in my opening remarks, I mentioned competitive advantage, and we've done some very careful analysis about where are the current threats, and we use largely Russia and China to benchmark our capabilities. And if you go back to 1999 or 2000, we had what we should have as the United States of America, a nation that thinks and acts globally. 
we had a significant competitive advantage in our ability to project power when and where needed to advance our national interests. I can't say that today. We are challenged in our ability to project power both to Europe and in the Pacific as a result of those threats. And other nations, uh, to include non-state actors as well, have capabilities uh, on the high end that challenge our ability to project power. So over time, uh, that has eroded. With regard to the question about lieutenants and captains, I, I think I have some insight into that in, in the sense that I was a platoon commander in the late 1970s, and I lived through a period of time when we weren't properly resourced, we didn't have sufficient money for training, we didn't have sufficient personnel, and many times the tasks that we were asked exceeded our, our capability. I think it has to do with the confidence, and, and I would give you an example of a pilot. If you look at a pilot specifically, uh, you know, in the past, pilots might have had 30 hours a month to fly. Now they may be down as low as 15 hours a month. On a day-to-day -day basis, you may not be able to see the difference between pilot A and pilot B. But if there is an in-flight emergency, I can guarantee you that the pilot that has 30 hours will immediately feel much more comfortable and confident in their ability to deal with an anomalous situation, be able to control their physiological response. And you and I may never find out about that incident. On the contrary, if a pilot has 15 hours a month, we may very well find out about it because it's a Class A mishap. And our uh, non-combat casualties and fatalities are now higher than in operations than in combat. Chairman A.R., and, and I would attribute that to two things. I mean, one, it's the material condition that, that does affect the numbers of hours that a pilot flies, a driver drives, so forth. It's also the size of the force relative to the requirements that we have. Uh, going back to my lieutenant days, if you think about training, whether it's on a ship, in a plane, or in the infantry as a series of 101, 201, 301, 401 tasks, uh, when I was a lieutenant, uh, we didn't go to 201 until we were confident that we were, that we were well-founded in 101. And we didn't go to 301 until we were well-founded in 201. And I would argue that, well, we may have trained a standard in the past when we had sufficient time and resources. Now we're training the time because that ship is going to go to sea, that pilot is going to go to war, that infantryman is going to go to war, uh, whether or not they've had an opportunity to retrain sometimes in the basic tasks or not. Do you believe it's possible for the United States to achieve its national security objectives in Afghanistan as long as Pakistan provides support and sanctuary to groups such as the Taliban and the Qani Network? Uh, I do not believe that we can attain our objectives in Afghanistan, Chairman, uh, unless we materially change the behavior of Pakistan. And have you got thoughts on how you do that? Uh, Chairman, uh, well, it will require a, a broad approach to do it. I, I think it's unacceptable that you, you hit you hit the uh, key issue. It's unacceptable that Pakistan provides uh, sanctuary, and we ought to bring the full weight of the U.S. government and our coalition partners uh, on Pakistan to ensure that they do not provide the sanctuary that they have provided historically to groups like Haqqani and the Taliban. Are you satisfied? Now, with the rules of engagement, which have been changed with the new administration? Chairman, uh, I, I am. And, uh, and, I, and I had a long conversation with General Nicholson and NATO over the weekend to ensure that he also had the same degree of confidence. Uh, Secretary Mattis has, has spoken to General Nicholson in the past week to make sure he's confident that he has the rules of engagement uh, that allow him uh, to engage any enemy that uh, is a threat to the Afghan government our mission, coalition forces, or U.S. personnel. Some of it reminiscent of our rules of engagement during the Vietnam conflict? Well, Chairman, they, they may have been. I, I can assure you today that we have the rules of engagement necessary to advance our objectives in Afghanistan and to protect the force as well. Thank you, Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General Dunford. Um, in response to the committee's pre-hearing policy questions, you indicated that Iran is adhering to its obligations under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action of the JCPOA. But you do rightfully point out that they are engaged in uh, extremely destabilizing activities in the region, um, missile development, uh, activities that can't be tolerated. But going back to JCPOA, uh, is it your view that it was designed to limit their nuclear capacity and that it is currently achieving that objective? 
Uh, Senator, it, it was designed specifically to address uh, what I would describe as, as one of the five major threats of Iran, the nuclear threat. As you point out, what the, what the agreement didn't address was the missile threat, the maritime threat, Iran's support of proxies, and the cyber activity that they have conducted. And they're still uh, pursuing those other uh, venues very aggressively, in your view? Uh, the Senator, and, and we see a physical manifestation of that in Yemen. We see it in Iraq. We see it in Lebanon. Uh, we see it in Syria. Uh, in this complicated world where there's so much going on, we have our focus on North Korea. Uh, if we were to step away from the JCPOA, would that have an effect, in your professional view, on the ability, ability to negotiate or to come to some type of non-kinetic solution in Korea? <laughs> Senator, it makes sense to me that uh, our, our uh, holding up agreements that we have signed, unless there's a material breach, uh, would have an impact on others' willingness to sign agreements. And, and in terms of a force that we've all uh, comment on is stretched, uh, if in reaction to uh, rejecting the JCPOA, would you assume that the Iranians would step up their activity even more, uh, causing us to uh, at least con in a contingency have forces that would be in that area and not able available for Korea? Uh, Senator, I would. Uh, we, we watch every day, and this is even in addition to the JICPOA issue, just our relationship with Iran. We watch every day for indicators that either Iranian-backed militia forces or Iranian maritime forces would pose a threat to the force. Uh, we have postured the force to deal with those threats, and we watch the intelligence carefully to make sure our posture every day is in the context of the current threat. Uh, it, you've said it, and the Secretary of Defense have said it, and the, the White House has said it too, is that our major effort against North Korea is diplomatic at this moment. Um, is that um, accurate? Sure military dimension today is uh, in full support of the economic and diplomatic pressure campaign that Secretary of State is leading uh, in North Korea. One of the things that it's difficult to comprehend is we do not have an ambassador in South Korea, do we? Uh, we do not. We have a charge at this time. Senator. And in effect, General Brooks is sort of doing double duty informally? We're, no, Senator, we're, we're very proud of, uh, of, of what General Brooks is doing right now as, as both a uh, he sits there at the nexus of uh, the political military. No, I'm very, as you have confidence in General Brooks, but it's, if we're in a diplomatic mode, we don't have an ambassador until we don't also have an assistant secretary for the area <laughs> in the State Department. We just don't seem to have the team in place to, to have an all-court press for a diplomatic solution. Is that unfair comment or? Uh, Senator, I, I, I certainly uh, probably would comment on that only because I have clearly heard Secretary Tillerson also comment on uh, the difficulty he has right now uh, doing all the things that the State Department's been called upon to do with some of the some of the gaps that continue to exist. Uh, in terms of the situation on the peninsula now, can you give us your your judgment of where we are today? given the statements back and forth between leaders of both countries, given our aerial operations off the coast, given the response yesterday that could trigger a reaction by the North Koreans. Can you give us an assessment? Senator, Senator I can. Uh, you know, while the political space is, is clearly very charged right now, we haven't seen a change in the posture of North Korean forces. Uh, we watched that very carefully. Uh, we clearly have postured our forces to respond in the event of a provocation uh, or a conflict. Uh, we also have taken all the proper measures to protect uh, our allies, uh, the South Koreans, the Japanese, the force, as well as Americans in the area. Uh, but, but what we haven't seen uh, is military activity that would be reflective of the charged political environment that you're describing. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Dunford, I'd like to pursue two things, one intelligence and the other modernization. Um, in doing this, I want to get three statements in the record to begin with. Uh, on Sunday, Kim Jong-un released a propaganda video depicting the U.S. aircraft carrier and bomber being blown up by North Korean missiles. He further threatened that a U.S. attack would see our forces, as he said, head to the grave. 
Uh, I've been very proud of the, the uniforms coming out and talking about the, how real the threat is. General uh, Hyten, the strategic command commander, said last week that he views North Korea's ability to deliver a nuclear weapon on an ICBM as a matter of when, not if. And uh, uh, Defense Intelligence Agency assesses that North Korea will be able to reliably range the U.S. mainland with uh, nuclear ICBMs by the end of 2018. Well, I remember when that 2018 was 2020 and it was 2019. Uh, I'd, I'd have to ask you how confident you are in the in our intelligence uh, uh, community's ability to monitor and detect just where they are and how accurate you believe that end of 2018 is. Hey, Senator, from my review of the intelligence, I, I think that uh, what General Hyten said and what you've just described reflects the collective judgment of uh, of the senior leadership in the department. And I, and I think something that uh, General Hyten said is something I've also said in public is that whether it's three months or six months or 18 months, mm -hmm. it is soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we ought to conduct ourselves as though it is just a matter of time and a matter of a very short time before North Korea has that capability. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to get in the record, uh, name a couple of the unique challenges in getting intelligence uh, on North Korea that don't exist in other places. Uh, they, well, they may exist to some degree in other places. Uh, the North Koreans over time have buried uh, much of their capability underground, which creates new challenges. There's also some specific weather challenges in North Korea that, that limits our collection at various periods of time. And to be honest with you, Senator, uh, part of it also has been you know, the competing demand for uh, a limited amount of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Certainly over the last 18 months, uh, we have increased our collection uh, against North Korea, but for a long period of time we had decreased our collection against, against North Korea because of competing demands elsewhere in the world. So I think those are probably three of the most significant challenges we face. That's good. They, and I assume you're equally concerned about their uh, activity in trading technology, missile technology with other countries such as Iran? S Senator, we are. We, we've looked at that nexus uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'm not sure we've seen any transfer of nuclear technology, but we certainly have seen missile technology and a wide range of other weapon systems uh, that they have exported yeah. or expertise that they have exported outside of North Korea. Okay. On, on uh, modernization, both of the uh, Army generals, Anderson and Murray, said recently at, in our subcommittee, given the complex range of threats, the Army has a very short window to improve capability and capacity. Meanwhile, our adversaries are closing the, the capacity gap. I think you said, in your, if I wrote it down correctly, you said if we don't have sustained funding, we'll lose our qualitative and quantitative advantage over our adversaries. I think that, that, that is accurate. Um, and you've expressed your concern that we're getting very close um, on that. Is that correct? I have, Senator, and I, I think this reflects uh, both uh, the Chinese, the Russians, and others have studied our strengths over the course now of 20 years. Yeah. And they've been on a path of developing capabilities that exploit our vulnerabilities, and we know what those are, and, uh, and we have a plan to correct those. But if we don't correct those, our ability to project power, for example, when the Army talks about it, our ability to project power into Europe, but then operate freely within Europe uh, to include to support our forces with logistics bases, sustainment efforts, is going to be challenged. And I think your statement, uh, along with some of the other military, some of the uniforms, are helpful to us because the American people really don't understand the level of threat that's out there, the uh, complexity of how it's not something that's happened before, and that we need to start prioritizing uh, our military and our defense issues. One last thing, General uh, Milley recently testified during the, uh, the 18 Army posture hearing that we are now outranged and outgunned. Uh, do you agree with that statement? Uh, relative to certain threats under certain conditions, I do, Senator. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General Dunford, for your service. Um, the uncertainty that's facing our transgender men and women in uniform since late July has been deeply unsettling to many members of the committee. Uh, Chairman McCain, Ranking Member Reed, Susan, Senator Susan Collins, and I have introduced a bipartisan bill that would prevent the Department of Defense from separating currently serving transgender individuals solely based on their gender identity. These men and women across all services and occupations were told by the Department of Defense that they would be allowed to serve openly and continue in their military careers. 
Many have worked diligently within their chains of command to meet every requirement put forth by the former administration. Now they have been plunged uh, into a career of uncertainty, and their service and sacrifices have been unfairly tarnished. Many of us on the committee are deeply disturbed by the developments of the last few months. Um, do you agree that our thousands of openly serving transgender men and women have served their country with honor and valor? Uh, I do, Senator. I, I would just probably say that uh, I believe any individual who meets the physical and mental standards uh, and is worldwide deployable uh, and is currently serving should be afforded the opportunity to continue to serve. Thank you. If reappointed, can you promise currently serving transgender individuals who have followed department policy and meet every requirement, as you just said, asked of them that they will not be separated from the armed services based solely on their gender identity? Senator, I can promise that that will be my advice. What, I, what I've just articulated is the advice I've provided in private and I've just provided in public. Thank you. And have you had the opportunity to meet with any of the thousands of transgender individuals currently serving in uniform on active duty to hear how the recent developments have impacted their lives? Uh, and if not, will you commit to doing so? Uh, I have not since, the, uh, since, I guess, <coughs> August when the announcement was made, but, but I would certainly do that, Senator. Thank you. Um, on the subject of military sexual violence, um, we've been at this for a while now. Uh, every Secretary of Defense since Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense have said zero tolerance for sexual assault in the military. But we still have serious issues of climate. Our assault rate is still 15,000 estimated assaults, sexual uh, acts and unwanted sexual contact. Um, but we really aren't moving the needle in the way we should. Uh, during a hearing over the last few years, we had General Dempsey, um, who said in 2014, he said that we are currently on the clock, if you will. Uh, if we don't make serious progress in a year, uh, we might have to look at legislation. Now, more than, the, more than half of the Senate has voted twice to take the decision making of whether a crime has been committed out of the chain of command and giving it to trained military prosecutors as a way to professionalize our military justice system. This is a reform that our allies have already done long ago, mostly for defendants' rights, whether it's the UK, whether it's Israel, whether it's Australia, Canada, Netherlands. And they've done it purposefully because they believed that if someone could be sent to jail for life, that the decision maker who makes those decisions should be well-trained as a criminal prosecutor, have no biases, not know the perpetrator uh, or the victim, the accused or the accuser, uh, and have that criminal justice background so that they can leave biases at the door. We've done every type of reform that has been recommended by every panel that's been impaneled to look at this. We have special victims councils in place to give survivors more legal advice during the process. We have changed the rules of evidence to make them more similar to the civilian system so there's more protections. We have done literally anything anyone can think of that the Department of Defense will not oppose. We've made retaliation a crime three years in a row. Not one case has gone to court martial of retaliation of the hundreds of cases I've looked at, uh, the largest basis for each of the services. I look at all the sexual assault cases every year and do a broad-based review. So we're not fixing the problem. Uh, I would like a commitment from you that you will work with me on ways to fix this problem and to honestly look at this command structure because more often than not, the decisions that are being are made aren't necessarily the right decisions. Using non-judicial punishment when going to court martial is recommended by those who have done the investigation. Uh, kicking somebody out who has many witnesses against them instead of taking them to court martial. Uh, these are kinds of decisions that are not making our military stronger. So I would like your commitment that you will work with me on this issue this year to try to make a difference to solve this problem. Uh, Senator, I, I don't think any of us are satisfied with where we are, and, I, and I, I would commit to work with you to look at this issue. Thank you. General, let me just say that this committee has had hundreds of hours of, of hearings, input from leaders such as yourself. Uh, from this issue has been thoroughly vetted by this committee. The Secretary of Defense is looking at this issue and others. And I am convinced that the one 
aspect of this issue that this chairman will not tolerate, and that is to undermine or cause the commanding officer not to have both authority and responsibility in this process. I just want to make that very clear to you, the position of the majority of this committee. We've got a lot of work to do on the issue, but to take away the commanding officer's authority and responsibility would be a violation of everything I've ever known about the United States Navy for 70 years. Uh, Chairman, can I, can I respond Please. to both you and Senator Gillibrand? I mean, I'm on record as having said, and I believe this, that uh, we will not solve uh, the problem unless commanding officers are singularly, personally accountable and responsible for command climate and for fixing, fixing the problem. Uh, what I, what I uh, answered to Senator Gillibrand, just to be clear uh, and, and to be honest today, is to continue to look at the issue and find ways to address sexual assault. Uh, I was not referring to the chain of command not being responsible or accountable. My experience is similar to yours over the last 40 years that any problem we have ever had inside of the organization has been solved when commanders were engaged, responsible and accountable for solving that problem. Well, I thank you uh, for that statement, uh, General, and uh, we will continue to debate it. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done, as I think you'd be the first uh, to acknowledge, but to say that commanding officers no longer have responsibility for the conduct of those under their command uh, undermines about 200 and some years of military uh, chain of command and responsibility. If commanding officers are not carrying out those responsibilities, then they should be, uh, then their lack of assumption of responsibility that they should be held accountable to. But to take them out of the chain of responsibility, in my view, is a serious, serious mistake. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Dunford, for being here today and for your continued service. On July 4th and July 28th, North Korea tested a new missile now known as the KN-20. And based on the capabilities demonstrated in these tests, numerous press reports estimate that the missile has a potential range of over 10,000 miles, which would put much of the United States within its reach. And while I understand technical hurdles still remain before North Korea possess a reliable, accurate, and nuclear-capable ICBM system. What's your assessment of the ballistic missile threat to the homeland from North Korea? Where do you see that trend line moving? Senator, I think for all planning purposes, capability development, we should assume now that North Korea has the capability. As you suggest, there are some technical elements of their program that haven't been fully tested, from a reentry vehicle to some of the ability to stabilize uh, a missile in flight. But, but I view all those as engineering solutions that will be developed over time. And frankly, I think we should assume today that North Korea has that capability and has the will to use that capability. The last major modification of our homeland missile defenses came in 2013 when, in response to an accelerating threat from North Korea, then Secretary Hagel announced plans to increase the number of interceptors from 30 to 44. And given what we've witnessed over the past year, do you believe that the current threat environment requires additional homeland missile defense capabilities? I do, Senator, and, and over the last uh, seven or eight weeks, uh, we did a very detailed look at uh, increasing ballistic missile defense capability uh, for the North Korean threat, certainly, but for other threats as well, and we do think an increase uh, is warranted. And I believe in the NDAA, and we certainly support that, there's an additional 21 interceptors that's, that are in the, uh, the NDAA that was just passed. Right, and should uh, the department uh, program <coughs> additional resources towards ballistic missile defense across the FIDEP? Uh, Senator, we, we should, and, and uh, both the Congress and the President have directed us to do that, and we have. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on some previous questions um, that I think we were, we were trying to get to what, uh, what happens when operational demands um, aren't necessarily met. 
as you know, we conducted a hearing uh, recently on the naval accidents that are happening in the Pacific, and we looked at um, the concern that the, the Navy is, is trying to do too much with too little. It demands outpacing the supply. That's what we're seeing. Um, and I don't think it's just focused on the Navy. I think uh, there's concerns with other services as well. We know the Navy's doing its reviews, and I think those really focus on the supply side of the, op of the equation on that. Can you tell me if the Joint Staff is reviewing the operational demands that have been placed on the Navy and have these incidents have an, an impact on the way that, that we are looking at how to assess a high op tempo, um, how that poses um, a risk to our, to our forces now? Senator, we, we, have, we have reviewed that, and, uh, and what we're making sure now is that uh, readiness of the force uh, as well as our, re our ability to respond to the unexpected is a key element even as we meet the requirements. You know, in the past, without going into a lot of detail, we had a bottom-up process for global force management, meaning each one of the commanders provided us with all their requirements, and then we kind of leveled across and met all those requirements. We have now implemented, and this year we'll implement it for the first time, a top-down process where we fence certain numbers of forces as a result of the services needing those forces to be back in the United States to generate readiness or somewhere else located where they are generating readiness and not allocated so we can continue to sustain the force. We realize that uh, what we've been doing in the past is unsustainable moving forward. The, the demand does exceed the supply, and we need to make an adjustment to the demand as well as the supply, as you as you alluded to, Senator. Do you anticipate reducing the demand? Uh, I, I anticipate uh, managing risk in a different way until we can grow the capacity to meet the demand. I do. Does that put uh, more of a threat on the on the readiness of our of our troops? Then, it, I mean, they're not just they're not just. Uh, take the Navy. They're not just out there on ships um, doing operations with, with no strategy in place. They are not, Senator, but what we have to do is get to the point where we have a balance between the time that units are at home station training, developing their capabilities, and the time they're deployed. If you, if you talk about the Navy example, uh, I was aboard the USS Barry uh, some months ago. The USS Barry had been at sea 70 percent of the time in the previous 12 months. So when we go back now and we look at uh, were they able to do all the training necessary and what was their life like during those 12 months, 70% of the time underway is an unsustainable rate, and so we're going to have to make adjustments in the demand that will incur uh, managing uh, operational and strategic risk, there's no doubt. Thank you. And then also incur, <coughs> include 100-hour work weeks. Uh, Chairman, absolutely. And, and when, when sailors are at sea 70% of the time, uh, they're at work most of every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Dunford, I want to thank you for your leadership, your continued service to our nation and to your family. Thank you very much. Um, I think you've done an extraordinary job and we're privileged to have you in this position. In your written responses to the committee's questions in advance of this hearing, you addressed a few of my questions about improving mental health and suicide prevention services. You highlighted the growth in embedded mental health providers. The FY15 NDAA included a bipartisan provision called the Sexton Act that I authored with Senator Wicker. It requires every service member to get a confidential mental health assessment each year. In the past, you and the service chiefs have said that you believed it would be fully implemented no later than October 1 of this year, which is next week. Um, General, are the services fully implementing the requirements for robust annual mental health uh, assessments? Senator, thank you. And, and as you know, I've, I've worked that issue personally now for some years, and, and I appreciate your support in that area. Um, the Army, the National Guard, several of our components are completely compliant, and they'll make the deadline. There are some outliers that haven't that haven't met the standard, and uh, I was aware of that as I prepared for my testimony. So I can assure you that both the secretary and I will be engaged in, in cleaning it up. I think the vast majority of the department uh, has 
become compliant with the Sexton Act, but there are some outliers, and, and we'll get the full, full details to you. I became aware of that this week as we, as we prepared for testimony. Thank you. Um, can you describe your understanding of our strategy to counter North Korea and how you're working with your partners across interagency? To execute I, that. I can't, Senator. Uh, and very briefly, when Secretary Tillerson came in last year, uh, people told him that there were two things that he couldn't do anything about. One was that nuclear weapons were inextricably linked to survival of the regime in North Korea. They wouldn't trade away nuclear weapons. And the second is that China wouldn't cooperate. Secretary Tillerson is uh, testing those two assumptions uh, because the alternatives at the time to not testing those two assumptions were so dire. So we have now a pressure, pressurization campaign applying economic and diplomatic means primarily uh, to force the North Koreans uh, to, to uh, denuclearize the peninsula. We are also working very closely with the Chinese. Secretary Tillerson has been almost relentless in dealing with the Chinese over the past few months to get them cooperate with the, uh, with the UN sanctions regime. On the positive side, there's been four UN, four, in, four UN resolutions passed this year, and I think the Chinese cooperation, to include the China, Russian cooperation in passing those sanctions, is unprecedented. We're at the phase now where implementation of the sanctions is going to determine whether or not we have a peaceful solution to denuclearization on the peninsula. So we are continuing with the military dimension to support primarily Secretary Tillerson's economic and diplomatic pressure campaign but also making it clear that there, is, uh, there are military options available to the president if the economic and diplomatic pressure campaign fails. We think that's important that North Korea understand that. We also think it's important that China understand that. And I personally went to China uh, in the middle of August uh, during the recess to deliver that message to Chinese senior leadership. When you look at North Korea, um, and, and there's significant speculation about Kim Jong-un's motives, but do you think it's about just survival of the regime, or do you think he is also looking um, to take over South Korea as well? Senator, I look back at, uh, you know, our, our experience with North Korea, and I realize that uh, Kim Jong-un has only been there for a short period of the history. Since 1953, we have effectively deterred North Korea from, from uh, attacking South into, or attacking into South Korea. Uh, my assessment, based on the intelligence I've read, is that Kim Jong-un's uh, development of nuclear capability and his development of missile technology is primarily associated with regime survival. That's not to say that they don't pose a threat to South Korea and to others in the region, but my judgment is that that is what has driven his, uh, his path of development over the past 18 months. Um, switching over a little bit to Syria, um, you've had significant success in Iraq, uh, moving ISIS out. Uh, there's uh, ongoing battles in the Raqqa area. Six months from now, where do you hope to be? Uh, six months from now, uh, Senator, with, the, with the, uh, I guess from experience, always cautious about, uh, about laying out timelines, uh, and so I won't for the campaign. But I, but I do believe uh, that we will have completed operations more properly. Our partners will have completed operations in Raqqa, and we'll be well on our way to, uh, to going after the external operations capability and immediate capability uh, of ISIS that remains in the middle Euphrates River Valley. And, and we'll also uh, be supporting our Iraqi security forces partners on the east side of the border to better secure the border between uh, Iraq and Syria. So I think we'll have continued to degrade most importantly, their external operations capability, the ability they have to plan and conduct external operations. I think we'll have undermined the credibility of the narrative. They will increasingly not be able to say that there's a physical caliphate in existence. Uh, I think that'll have an impact on the recruiting. We've already seen the numbers drop, the numbers of individuals who are uh, inspired to join uh, the ISIS movement. So I think we'll continue to see reduction in territory, reduction in freedom of movement, reduced resources, and less credibility in the narrative. And those are the four areas where I think we'll continue to see progress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ask what your take is on the vote in Kurdistan. Chairman, uh, in the wake of that vote, my primary concern now is making sure that the vote doesn't uh, disrupt the cooperation that we have seen between the Peshmerga and the Iraqi security forces. The real challenge 
in the campaign right now is that operations in the north, the reason why we were successful in Mosul, the reason we're successful in the north is because of the cooperation between the Peshmerga and the Iraqi security forces. If you look at the next uh, area that the Iraqis are focused on in the Hawija area, which is southwest of Kirkuk, it's going to require cooperation between the Kurds and the Iraqi security forces. So I'm concerned uh, that the referendum will disrupt that cooperation. But my focus from a military perspective will be try to mitigate the effects. And I know that's what Secretary Mattis and General Votel are also trying to do, is mitigate the effects. And President Erdogan has made some pretty aggressive statements. President Erdogan has made some very aggressive statements, uh, and, uh, and so have the Iranians, uh, Chairman. Senator Cut. General, welcome back. Congratulations on your renomination, and thank you for your many decades of service. Uh, in your written testimony, you stay on page 10 that Iran has not changed its malign activity since the JCPOA went into effect. Have they increased the pace or scope of their malign activities? Uh, Senator, I, I think you could argue that they have, uh, certainly in Syria. Uh, I think it's been relatively constant in Yemen with regard to their support for the Houthis. Clearly, their support for Lebanese Hezbollah has, uh, has been at a high level for, for some period of time. So in those, uh, in those three areas, uh, I would say that Syria is the one place where it's probably increased. And you could argue over the last few months whether or not it's related to Jikpo or not that uh, Iranian activity inside of Iraq has certainly increased as they look to the end game uh, in, in Iraq. Thank you. Uh, without going to the content of rules of engagement, which are obviously classified, uh, have our rules of engagement changed in the last eight months since President Trump took office in the Persian Gulf as it relates to Iranian harassment using small craft or drones or aircraft? Our, our, our rules of engagement have not changed, Senator. What, what we have done in the wake of a number of incidents is We've gone back at every level uh, from the Fifth Fleet to the United States Central Command and made it very clear uh, what our forces were capable of doing or that it be threatened. And so I'm confident that it's in, in application of rules of engagement, if our forces are threatened, they are both postured and capable of effectively responding. Thank you. On page 29 and 30 of your written testimony, you restate your support for our nuclear triad as well as modernizing the National Airborne Operations Command Center. Um, strangely to me, the Air Force has just announced that the next version of Air Force One will not have in-flight refueling capability. What do you make of that? Uh, Senator, I think that was a decision that was not made by the, uh, by the Air Force, but made uh, by the White House, and I, I think it had to do with uh, fiscal constraints on the program. That will certainly be a limiting factor, uh, and we'll have to plan accordingly. I think we might need to revisit that decision here on Capitol Hill. Um, I want to turn to the Open Skies Treaty. Not many Americans know about that, but it allows the United States and Russia and many other countries, but primarily those two countries, to fly aircraft over each other's territory and to take lots of pictures. Um, Russia has been violating that treaty, as Secretary Mattis testified earlier this year. I assume that you agree with his testimony from earlier this year. I, I do, Senator, and, and we as a nation declare them in violation back in June. And uh, there's a Wall Street Journal article today saying that in Vienna today, we will take steps to curb their flights in response to their actions by limiting our flights over Kaliningrad, their enclave in Europe, at which they hold most of Europe at risk, their limitations in Abkhazia and South Ossetia and uh, Chechnya, uh, and also their altitude floor over Moscow. Um, are those steps that we're about to take? Uh, those, are, those are all part of a, an overall effort. Uh, Senator, let me probably just re make sure that we make it clear. We believe that, on balance, it would be best if the treaty uh, continued to be in place. But we don't believe the treaty should be in place if the Russians aren't compliant. And so there is a decidedly uh, aggressive diplomatic effort right now to bring the Russians back into compliance, which we think would be the best outcome. Do you expect some of these reported steps, for instance, restricting flights over Alaska and Hawaii, will bring Russia back into compliance? Uh, Senator, I don't know. But, but this is the best plan we have right now to bring them in compliance before we may consider other alternatives. Given the size and capabilities of our satellite constellation versus Russia's, is it fair to say that Russia gets more benefit from these flights than does the United States? I, I believe that argument's been made, and it can, it's compelling to me. I want to turn to missile defense in North Korea. Um, we focus a lot on systems like Aegis Ashore and THAAD, um, or our West Coast interceptors. Um, what's the prospects currently for a boost phase intercept, specifically from unmanned aerial vehicles, either 
with hit to kill interceptors or with uh, directed energy? Senator, there's been a, a lot of work done on boost phase, as you know uh, from asking the question. We don't have that capability right now. I, I would offer to you a, a classified briefing at a time of your convenience to walk you through where we think we may be right now, but we do not have that capability today. I think we have that scheduled for later today. It'd be a hell of a thing if we could put a UAV up over the North Korean peninsula and shoot down any missile as it was taking off. Um, I'd suggest that we need to look as aggressively as we can at that. Finally, uh, General, uh, the deaths of the sailors uh, in the Western Pacific um, has commanded a lot of attention, rightfully so. Uh, you had, I believe, 15 Marines that were badly wounded a couple weeks ago uh, out on the West Coast, though, in a fire involving an amphibious assault vehicle. Um, how are those Marines doing today? Uh, Senator, I don't, I don't know how each one of them individually is doing, but we've been getting routine reports about their progress, and they are making progress. So some of them, you know, some significant injuries. I know that uh, you're, the Marine Corps is conducting a review of the matter and will have a report. Um, what's the likelihood that the impact of the many years of sequestration budget cuts uh, could have played a role uh, in either the level of training or operations and maintenance for that vehicle in this incident? Senator, I can't talk to that specific incident, but, but I am confident that uh, a combination of fiscal challenges and high operational tempo have created conditions that actually have led to some of these incidents. Of that, I'm confident. Thank you, General. Senator Rono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Dunford, welcome back. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet with you not too long ago. And with the natural disasters that have been occurring, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the many members of our armed forces, uh, including the active National Guard and reserve personnel who uh, were very instrumental in helping to save lives and, and uh, uh, transporting supplies during the recent natural di disasters. General Dunford, in, in your 2015 confirmation hearing to serve as chairman, you stated that Russia presented the greatest threat to our national security, and you included their nuclear capability, uh, ability to interfere with our sovereignty of our allies, and you said their behavior was nothing short of alarming. And of course, we can now add involvement in our elections to the list. You then rank ordered China, North Korea, and ISIS, ISIL or ISIS as two to four on your list of threats to national security. In the intervening time, we uh, have uh, North Korea. So my question, as we sit here today, would you change your threat assessment order? Is North Korea still third on your list? Uh, Senator, the one thing I, I've said to my staff is that we don't actually have the luxury of identifying a single threat today, unfortunately, uh, nor, nor mm. necessary to look at it in a linear fashion. So what I would say is that in terms of a sense of urgency today, uh, North Korea certainly poses the greatest threat today. Uh, in terms of overall military capability, uh, I believe China, uh, Russia poses the greatest threat because of the nuclear, cyber, electronic warfare and, and, and the activity that we've seen from the Crimea to the Ukraine. If I look out to 2025 and I look at the demographics and the economic situation, I think China probably poses the greatest threat to our nation by, by about 2025, and that's consistent with much, uh, with much of our analysis. So that's, that's you know, in other words, I, I, I can't look at it just in terms of overall capability, but I've got to factor in time and conditions, and when I do that, I look at all three of those threats in that way. I would, um, I, I would agree with you in terms of your assessment, and particularly with regard to North Korea being an immediate threat. Uh, I'm always asked, of course, Hawaii being in the middle of the Pacific, we feel quite vulnerable. So um, it is on the forefront of, of uh, certainly of my minds of constituents, and particularly, of course, not just Hawaii, but Guam and Alaska. And I understand that the results of the ballistic missile defense review are expected <clears throat> later this year. Is, is that correct? Uh, Senator, they are, but, but we didn't wait for the review to request increased ballistic missile defense capability. Uh, we've done that in the last couple of weeks and also noted that in the NDAA, uh, the committee also uh, addressed that. Well, I, I know that a large new radar system is being planned for Hawaii. And I, I just uh, had a, a meeting with uh, Admiral Harris, and this will take a few years. And and uh, he indicated that it would be good to move up the uh, radar for Hawaii uh, a year or two. And I'd, I'd really like to put that in, in, in to your um, way of thinking so that we can get on with that uh, radar system. I certainly want to ensure that Hawaii, Alaska, and, and the rest of the United States are protected. Do you, uh, as we sit here today, uh, are we adequately protected, Alaska, Hawaii, 
rest of the United Senator, States? Senator, we are adequately protected against the current threat. And I think one of the issues that we all ought to appreciate is that as the capacity of the threat increases, that is the size, not just the lethality, not just the fact that North Korea can reach us, but the numbers of missiles that they may possess that can reach us, then what we need to be concerned about is ensuring that our ballistic missile defense capability keeps pace with that threat. I think it's, a, it's very important to have that ongoing assessment. And uh, in particular, if we project uh, maybe uh, three years uh, down, the lo down the road, uh, as far as uh, North Korea's capabilities, I b believe that there is an assessment or, uh, occurring as to whether or not Hawaii needs um, uh, a system in place b besides the radar. So um, that is my understanding. A absolutely, Senator. And, and we, are, we are constantly assessing, and again, as recently as the last uh, several weeks where we made some recommendations based on that assessment, our ability to protect all Americans, Guam, Hawaii, uh, continental United States, Alaska. I know you were asked about the JCPOA, and um, you state that briefings you have received indicate that Iran is uh, meeting, adhering to its obligations under the JCPOA. My question is, as long as Iran is in compliance, is it in America's national security interest to maintain the JCPOA? Uh, Senator, the intel community assessment is, in fact, that we, they are in compliance right now, and, uh, and therefore I think we should focus on addressing the other challenges, the missile threat they pose, the maritime threat they pose, the support of proxies, terrorists, and, uh, and the cyber threat they pose. Yes, and uh, those were not areas that were covered <clears throat> under the JCPOA. They were not, Senator. Yes. So is it your intent to advise the president to, to uh, recertify Iran's compliance ahead of the October 15th deadline? Senator, uh, mindful of, uh, of the chairman's opening comments, uh, I, I, what I would ask is if I could provide the advice uh, that I'm providing to the president now prior to his decision to be in private, certainly share that, but not to do that publicly until after the president has made a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. General, the, the, the Budget Control Act is a symptom of a much larger problem Congress has been avoiding for far too long, a looming national security issue that I hope you could comment on. The Congressional Budget Office reports that by 2025, mandatory spending will be 51 percent higher than it is today and interest we pay on the national debt will nearly double as a percentage of GDP. CBO projects that the impact on discretionary spending will result in about a 13 percent reduction to defense spending as a percentage of GDP. My question is, as the future year's defense program begins to overlap the mid-2020s, has the Department of Defense started to look at how this fiscal picture might change what we can afford <clears throat> and where we invest? And has the potential fiscal future been accounted for in any of our future operating concepts or global power projection strategies? Senator, our, our planning to date, uh, first and foremost, has highlighted uh, the fact that uh, our, our capabilities are going to require somewhere between 3 and 7 percent, and I, we can debate that, and I'm perfectly willing to come over here with the analytic foundation for my assessment that between 3 and 7 percent, and that's dependent on how much risk you want to assume as you build a force, but between 3 and 7 percent is going to be required for us to build the capabilities we need. Where did we come up with that percentage? We looked at the capabilities of Russia and China today. We looked at the trajectory that they are on for capability development. We looked at where we are today and what investments we need to have to maintain a competitive advantage over those peer competitors. We use them as a benchmark, if you will, uh, in the mid-2020s. What, what I would say, I suppose, in response to your question is that we will have to fundamentally reorder the strategy if we are unable to build the capabilities and capacities to deal with those peer competitors. Right now, what we have done is we've taken the national security strategy, we've taken initial guidance from Secretary Mattis, he'll, he'll come out later with a defense strategy after the first of the year, and we've looked at the military capabilities and capacities necessary to, to support those strategies. There will be a fundamental disconnect if we don't uh, move on a path that I've just described. And yet at the same time, as Senator Hirono has just asked, the concern right now with regard to the topic of the day, which is North Korea, and the threats that they may pose, and the additional 
responsibilities imposed upon our military to respond to this particular uh, country's uh, uh, current activities and, and the threats that they suggest uh, with regard to you know, the use of ICBMs against any part of our country or our allies. And so in this particular case, as you've indicated, you believe or at least you think that right now we have the capabilities, but does that include the ability right now to protect Hawaii against an ICBM attack uh, by North Korea, and was that planned in? And what happens when that occurs? Do, you, do we do that, and do we place our resources on that? And does that change the overall planning for the next seven to ten years? Your Senator, based on the current capacity uh, of the North Koreans, the current threat, so both the type of the threat and the amount of, <clears throat> and the amount of missiles that they possess, we can protect Hawaii today against an ICBM. We can protect the continental United States against an ICBM. But it seems as though the American public simply assumed that that is just automatic, and then we've got the resources to not only respond to that and to still be able to build for the future threats, or at least to maintain our ability to defend against those future threats from our other peer competitors. And I guess that's my point is, is when we look at all of the different threats that are out there, the assumption that we simply have the resources right now and that we're not just keeping pace, but we are improving, is that a fair assumption on the part of the American public? Sir, there's, there's a few things that I wouldn't assume in the future were we not to make investments. I wouldn't assume access to space and all that that means for our economy and for our military capability. I wouldn't assume our ability to protect our, our networks, uh, both for commercial activity and military activity. I wouldn't assume our ability to deal with the growing electronic th warfare threat of our, our adversaries, and I wouldn't assume uh, the capability to deal with the growing ballistic missile and cruise missile threat of our adversaries unless we maintain pace with capability development. Those, those would be bad assumptions. And that requires more than what we would otherwise find under the 2011 Budget Control Act. Uh, there, there's no question. In fact, just to maybe put it in perspective, uh, Senator, the uh, bipartisan uh, NDAA that, that you just passed is $89 billion more than, uh, than what the BCA level would be, and probably some number less than what some members of the committee thought it ought to be. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. General, welcome and congratulations on the uh, renomination, and you have done a superb job, and, uh, you know, my vote is going to be that you continue to do a superb job. Thank you for the service. Um, you have testified often to us about the readiness challenges, and we had a, a pretty sobering uh, hearing last week digging into the potential sources of these Navy collisions and readiness issues and the extent of training is something that was on the table. We've had a recent report from the GAO about increased operations and extended maintenance challenges have uh, posed real problems on the Navy side. I was with the commander of the Langley Air Force Base this weekend, and he described to me reduction in training hours as being a real challenge. So everything you have testified to us about diminished readiness resulting from the budget sequester is, is coming true. Uh, it wasn't, you know, Chicken Little saying the sky is falling. What we've heard from military leaders since the sequester went into effect and the budget caps in March of 2013, we're seeing it. And I just think that it puts a, an additional burden on our shoulders to try to deal with it. I want to ask you about um, something that I'm really worried about now, which is the humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico. So often when there's a humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world, a tsunami in Southeast Asia, an Ebola crisis in Africa, the U.S. military is there, a projection of America's humanitarian um, spirit. Um, and I'm just stunned at this uh, humanitarian challenge in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, American citizens with an amazing track record of serving in the military over generations, centuries really. Um, could you talk a little bit about current DOD operations to try to prevent this humanitarian crisis from really spiraling downward in a way that would be devastating to these American citizens? Senator, thank you. In fact, one of the last things I did this morning before coming over here was was go through the Northern Command update. We get those every few hours, and, and so I had the most recent update uh, as of about 8.30 before I, before I came over here to the Hill. Uh, for us, uh, it's both professional and personal. These are Americans that need support. I've got 
people who have their families in Puerto Rico on my staff, uh, one of the heads of my personal security detail, until last night uh, hadn't heard from his family yet. So th this is something that's been on our minds and, and our thoughts and prayers with the people in Puerto Rico. The key thing that I think we are delivering right now, one of the challenges centered in getting aid has been the ports and airfields weren't accessible. And so step one is we're doing all we can do right now to increase the throughput of humanitarian supplies. That's something the U.S. military can uniquely provide. We also are providing some generators and so forth for power. We don't expect them to have power for some time, so that's something that is important that we can provide. And this and this impacts hospitals. And, that's it, that's and right. And so we have generators and so forth that, uh, that cannot uh, afford to be without uh, continuous power. Absolutely, Senator, and that's why power generation and generators are one of the key areas we're focused on right now. Fresh water and food clearly uh, right away, and then medical capabilities. So those are the key areas that uh, Northern Command under General Robinson's leadership are focused on right now. There's, there's literally hourly meetings between FEMA and the uh, government officials in Puerto Rico to make sure that we are doing all we can. The guidance uh, from Secretary Mattis has been clear. Uh, what they need, they get. Just make it happen. And, uh, and so what we're doing right now is just making sure that every place that we can uniquely contribute uh, to the disaster in Puerto Rico, we're poised to do that. And we're anticipating what they might need next week, even if they haven't thought about it yet. And just for purposes of committee members and the public, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm not sure I do. How was the Puerto, the response to Puerto Rico sort of organized? The DOD has a piece of it, but you are not necessarily the lead. Right. Is that sort of organized through DHS and FEMA and then you know, uh, with with the DOD taking on an assigned role, is that sort of how it's being led? That's exactly right, uh, Senator. This is this is any place in the United States, and so we are in support of FEMA, and General Robinson is a supporting uh, agency to FEMA, and so we're doing every all of the support for Puerto Rico is being coordinated, as you suggest, through Department of Homeland Security and FEMA specifically. And uh, but again, we're doing two things: we're responding to the immediate requests. But then we have a little experience in these kind of operations, and so I know what General Robinson mm -hmm. and her team are doing also is offering things that maybe people haven't asked for today and also looking around the corner to see what they might need next week. Very, very important for us to be on this because the scale of it is, is just devastating, and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, General Dunford, Ellen, to you both and your family. Thank you so much for your support of our men and women in uniform. I know it's a, a joint effort, um, so thank you very much. Um, we do agree, General, that properly resourcing a joint force really is a collaborative effort between Congress and our military and those military leaders. Uh, that is why many on this committee have pushed to repeal BCA. Uh, Senator Rounds brought up the financial implications moving forward and what sequestration might do in regards to many other, other issues that we're facing with our mandatory spending. Um, but looking at that, um, we also need to use what we have efficiently and effectively. I'm pushing for an audit within the DOD. I think many of us support that. We need to know that our taxpayer dollars are being spent well. For your part, can you describe the steps that you have taken during your tenure as the chairman to uh, work with that joint force and make it more efficient? Are there specific examples you can give the committee today? <coughs> Uh, there are, there are, Senator. The first one is that we're implementing the uh, direction that we have from the Congress to reduce our overall headquarters by 30%. Mm -hmm. That in itself is not an insignificant uh, step that, w that we have taken. Uh, also, with regard, we alluded to it with global force management. What we have done is uh, done a number of things to integrate uh, at the strategic level the prioritization and the allocation of resources to ensure that we are... Uh, deploying them most effectively and in the context of our, our, our strategic objectives. And then there's a number of things that, of course, uh, wouldn't be something that I would do in a joint force, but certainly am familiar with in dealing with the chief's uh, business practices across the department are also an area uh, where efficiencies are, are sought. Uh, the leader for that is the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and on the joint staff, the Vice Chairman sits with him on uh, what's called the Defense Management Advisory Group, and that involves all of the vice chiefs. And there's a wide range of, uh, of, of business practices that uh, we're looking to be more efficient. Uh, fortunately, we do have some expertise now from outside the department that has come in and looked at us uh, through a different lens. And so those are areas where I think they were most promised. But, but the other thing I'd say, Senator, is that since 2010, 
uh, we have gone through uh, a litany of efficiency drills. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and while we have gained some efficiencies, they never quite uh, realize the, the savings that you expect them to, so you got to stay after it. Mm -hmm. but, but this isn't something we started just in the past year. We really have, I think, in a concerted way, been after it since 2010. Very good, General, and I am certain that you will continue that push going on um, as we hope to see you continuing in this position. So uh, I thank you for that. And then in your answers to advanced policy questions, you also stressed your concern regarding our near-peer overmatch, and I share that concern as well. Unfortunately, the Department will send mixed messages to Congress. On one hand, our services ask for rapid acquisition of commercial off-the-shelf uh, systems uh, in, as a solution. And on the other, then they prefer appropriating dollars forward for the next best and greatest thing. But unfortunately, a lot of times, the next best, greatest thing never really uh, materializes. So how are we going to prioritize acquisitions moving in the future? Senator, that, that as you know, is, is, uh, is a complicated issue. And I think getting the balance right between moving out right now and buying what's available and then in looking long term for the most effective capability has been something we struggle with. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you, you might quickly say, hey, we ought to just be able to go out and buy what's available and field it. Well, I can remember some years ago when we ended up with 16 links that could communicate from air to ground, mm -hmm. and uh, but they couldn't necessarily communicate with each other. I can also remember when we all went out and bought our own software you know, only to find out that we couldn't effectively communicate with each other. So there is a balance in all of this. And I think the key thing is, in the, in the committee inserted some of the language in the NDAA, and that is to make sure that the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which is led by the Vice Chairman and reports to me and in the, in the Chiefs, is effectively one overseeing the requirements that, that are existing for capabilities, and also then the process for making sure that we meet those requirements in a timely manner, and those requirements are actually uh, validated. And I think that's probably a key piece of it too, is, is the requirements. I think if you get the requirements right, and senior leadership is engaged in the requirements, and I say this both from the perspective of my current job as well as a former service chief, service leader engagement with the requirements, validating those requirements before we look at material and non-material solutions to those requirements, in my judgment, is, is the key to success. And that is something that I think has happened to a greater degree over the last couple of years with the pressure in, in part that has been put on by this committee. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Beginning with, uh, I, I know uh, General Dunford, you're a you're a reader, and uh, going back to the to the chairman's statements at the beginning of this hearing about the relationship between the military and civilian officials, I commend to you, although I suspect you have already read a dereliction of duty by your colleague, uh, General McMaster, a stunning analysis of what not to do in terms of the relationship between civilian and military officials. You nodded. I, uh, I assume that means you, you, know, the, you know the book. Uh, Senator, I have read it. And I think uh, an additional one I would add to your list, it's a little bit longer, uh, Barbara Tuchman's March of Folly, which takes us from Troy to Vietnam, again, talking about relationships and how these mistakes are, are made. Which brings me to Korea. I have a queasy feeling that we're in 1914 stumbling towards Sarajevo. And what worries me is not an instantaneous nuclear confrontation, but an accidental escalation. Uh, based upon the rhetoric uh, that's going back and forth. The foreign minister of North Korea yesterday characterized our president's comments as a declaration of war. And he said, therefore, as a, since the United States has declared war in our country, we will have every right to make countermeasures, including the right to shoot down United States strategic bombers, even when they are not in the airspace border of our country. That's what worries me, is a misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and an event, a shooting down of a bomber, a, a strike on a, on a ship that leads to a countermeasure that leads to a countermeasure. And the end result is if King, Kim Jong-un feels his regime is under attack, then the unthinkable happens. Make me even, either feel better or worse about where we are. 
Uh, Senator, I, I will make you feel better. I, I can tell you that I personally, uh, the Secretary of Defense and Admiral Harris, uh, are looking at all of our posture in, uh, in managing risk on a day-to-day -day basis informed by the need to avoid the risk of miscalculation. Uh, the recent uh, operations that we conducted, I can assure you that uh, even I was on the road, we probably, uh, Secretary Mattis and I probably uh, personally invested several hours each in, uh, in reviewing those uh, to manage those and without going into classified information here to look at all of our capabilities, look at all their capabilities, look at timing, look at the probabilities. What worries me about is misunderstanding and misinterpretation. What we view as an exercise, they may view as an imminent threat. Senator, what I, I guess what I'm suggesting to you is that where we conduct these exercises, we're informed by uh, the North Korean posture at a given point in time. We're informed by the need to avoid miscalculation in an inadvertent uh, engagement. Do we have communication with North Korea uh, with regard to these kinds of, of, of situations? We, we, this, this is yeah. just an exercise, for right. example. Uh, we do not have military-to-military -military communications with uh, North Korea right now. Turning the North Korea question slightly, you testified earlier, and all the intelligence community agrees, that Kim Jong-un's primary motivation is regime survival. Therefore, it seems to me that statements that suggest regime change or regime destruction only solidify his uh, determination to develop and maintain nuclear weapons. Would you agree? Senator, I, I have been very careful at the, at the military level to make uh, no statements that would exacerbate the current crisis. And, and I, I certainly won't comment on, on things that our senior political leadership have said, but I certainly can tell you inside the military, uh, we've made no statements and we've had a conscious uh, decision not to make any such statements to ensure that the lead right now is Secretary Tillerson and the message that being delivered is primarily being delivered by the State Department. But you do agree that the primary motivation for the development of the nuclear weapons is a kind of insurance policy for regime survival. Is that not the case? That'd be my assessment, Senator. Fine. Thank you. Um, what would be the practicality of a preemptive nuclear strike or a preemptive military strike on North Korea in terms of the, the military effect? Would it, uh, there's some feeling, I hear somebody talked about a preemptive strike the other day, not in, not in the administration, but, uh, but on this, in this body. Uh, that would not be a short, easy action, would it not? Senator, you bring up a, a, a good point, and, and, and part of the advice that I've provided to date is when we do something, we shouldn't assume at that point that we can control escalation. So we need to, we need to think about this uh, in terms of what might happen as well as what we would want to happen. And part of the problem is those artillery uh, uh, that are ranged across the North Korean border within Seoul, which is about as far as from here to Fairfax County. That's right. The, the greater Seoul area, which has 25 million people, uh, 250,000 Americans on any given day, it would be in Seoul, would certainly be threatened by the rockets and the missiles uh, along the border. So a military, the, the idea of a so-called surgical strike, to bring back a term from 40 years ago, is really not valid in this situation. It would, it would not be, uh, this is not something that would be easy to take out, for example, the nuclear capability of the North Koreans. No, that's right, Senator. I mean, while we could do things that, uh, from our perspective, uh, it could be less than uh, a full execution of an operations plan, uh, we need to be informed by the potential risk to the greater Seoul area, no matter what we do on the peninsula. I think that's fair. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.